All right, we are recording and I am here for a very special discussion. Actually, this is gonna be an interview with the author, Ian C. Esselmont. He is the author of uh, quite a few books now in the Malazan world. He has the six book series, The Novels of the Malazan Empire, as well as the ongoing path to ascendancy with the uh, forthcoming, the Gistal. Uh, it is just such a pleasure to have you here Ian C. Esselmont, thank you for being here today. Well, happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation and the chance to talk. I'm very excited for it. Uh, this is going to be, I think, a very interesting interview for definitely myself and I, I know for lots of the viewers out there and a familiar face, uh, a, a, uh, my, my partner in crime as we're reading through the Malazan books, uh, both the novels of the Malazan Empire by Ian Esselmont, but also the Malazan book, The Fallen by Steven Erickson. It is none other than my good friend, Dr. A.P. Canavan. A.P., how are you? I am doing very well, Philip. It is absolutely brilliant to be here once again. I And to be honest, I don't know how much I'm going to add to this. Every once in a while, I might sort of, you know, interject just to annoy the two of you. But, you know, this <laughs> th this is this is all about uh, Monsieur Esselmont, the, yes. the dubious down there. So, um We'll 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 see what I can actually add at any point. <laughs> yes. I mean, I've got seats here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're looking forward to those interjections for sure. But this, as you say, is an interview of the author today, and we are going to be letting. Uh, this is partly in response to some feedback we got from some of our viewers who wanted to hear more from you, Cam. They wanted to, us to allow you the opportunity to just answer some questions and. Can you believe they didn't want to hear us as much? So uh, can you believe that, AP? I can't believe it. How can anyone not want to hear more of me? Like, I mean, my favorite <laughs> thing is to listen to myself speak. I'm assuming everyone's like that. <laughs> That's, it must be. Uh, but today we're, we're going to be listening to Cam's responses. And uh, we're, we're talking basically about your your journey as a writer and some of your inspirations and, and various other things. And, and yes, AP and I will be interjecting from time to time, but my role primarily is going to be just to ask these questions. So let's get started, I guess, uh, if we're all ready. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is, um, this is going back a little bit to the uh, chat you had with AP, where you talked about the origins of Dragnipur and uh, some inspiration behind the character uh, Anamanda Rake, uh, which I was very, it was a really great conversation that you had with AP. Uh, great video. I recommend it to everybody. Um, but it was a little bit of a surprise to me because I think I had heard, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but I had heard that uh, Stephen Erickson had said many times he hadn't read Moorcock's Elric books, right? Uh, and so this was not any kind of, he'd been asked so many times about this, but he's always saying, I know, I, I hadn't read those. Um, but when AP was talking with you, Cam, it emerged, now again, correct me if I'm wrong, but it emerged that you actually had read the Elric books and that Elric might have been uh, a, a part of the inspiration behind Anamanda Rake. So that, that was a great conversation. Okay. Roy, one, one sec. We're going to have evidence here, I think. Right. If Cameron, if you fall down and break your neck, <laughs> that, that's entirely on you. On a video. So, Moorcock. Oh, yeah. Um, Let's go back away. Sailor in the Seas of Fade, the Oak and the Ram, Warlord of the Air, the Ice Schooner. Um, when I was in uh, high school, junior high, growing up, it's, I was a big Moorcock fan. Okay, so junior high, high school. And so. Very formative then, I would say, if you were reading him in junior high and in high school, right? Well, he was one of those must read. He is one of those must read fantasy authors. I mean, if you yeah. want to be uh, literate in the genre, you have to know Moorcock, I think. Uh, this is not to disparage Steve's. <laughs> 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 but hang on a second. You know, let, let's back up a second. You know, you have to have read Moorcock to be literate in the genre. And and Stephen Erickson has never read Moorcock, the illiterate idiot. I think he's read him now. I think he said he's read him now. So he's okay. 
Uh, but, but so I, I, this is my way of uh, leading to the question of what are your, just broadly speaking, anything you want to talk about, what are your important literary influences, fantasy or otherwise? What do you consider to be some of your formative stuff? Um, well, uh, for the genre, um, we both or every all three of us here know the sort of the major threads of the high fantasy, the, the Tolkien, Tolkien-esque derived high fantasy. Um, and of course, I've read all of that many times over, The Lord of the Rings and The Silmarillion. Um, and then there is, of course, this other major thread or theme, which is, I think, sometimes referred to as sword and sorcery. And that is actually, for me personally, more of the influence. I, I would consider myself more of a, a follower of the sword and sorcery tradition in fantasy rather than the, the high fantasy thread. Okay. Uh, so in that vein, we have Moorcock uh, and we have, um, for me, Howard yeah. uh, as a formative influence. And I know AP is a bit skeptical of uh, Howard uh, and maybe not a big fan, but um, I think that if you look very carefully at his canon and weed out all of the rubbish that came later from Lynn Carter and Els Brogdon Camp and yeah. other meddlers, if you get rid of that and you just look at what he did, um, you'd be impressed. Um, there are no damsels in distress. We have strong female characters. We have a main character who, the stereotype of the brawny, brainless barbarian is that doesn't apply to Conan. Actually, he's extremely intelligent. Mm -hmm. uh, he rises through the ranks of any military organization that he joins. He becomes a general. Um, that's a smart guy, uh, and he has a code, a code of honor that he follows that he adheres to. Uh, so he has uh, values and principles. Uh, so I think there's a, a lot more there, I think if you dig down deep into it. No, let, allow me to interject. Okay. Cameron, <laughs> it's, not, it's not that I disparage or ignore hard. I, I mean, I, I think he's hugely influential in the field and I think he's, um, considering what he was doing and what he was working with and trying to publish in the pulps, some of the stories he produced are actually great. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of my initial perception of Hard was colored by that later, to call it editorial interference is, is generous. I mean, there's a line between editor and rewriting stories, uh, which perhaps those individuals crossed with Hard's work. And that, I think, not knowing um, at the stage that I was reading them, that some had been significantly interfered with, mm -hmm. colored my perception of him initially. But I, I don't disparage him. I think he's a very important writer and he did some uh, surprisingly complex things. I think the original map for Hyboria made no geographical or geological sense, but it's still, it, it was still an interesting world and it was a very interesting approach. And I think there's a lot of complex ideology and, and psychology has gone into those things. And when you bring in Hard's uh, quite troubled life into readings of that, it, he's a fascinating author to study. Um, so, meh. <laughs> Any well, other? And, and you know and of course we can't forget he's a product of his time so he shares a lot of the um yeah. problems that uh, lovecraft su uh, suffers from yeah. you know he has you know very sketchy views on race and and things like that so you have to accept that and 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 you know and acknowledge it um so any anyway, influences um hmm. like i say howard and moorcock and then um Trafford in the Grey Mouser series, Fritz, Fritz Lieber, Lieber, depending on how you want to uh, pronounce. Uh, I think there's a lot of, of Trafford in the Grey Mouser in the world of Malaz, uh, especially in, in the irreverent approach to, to a lot of things and the humor. Okay. Huh. Um, what, uh, what about Jack Vance? 
Um, you saw that, did you, in the pile? Yeah. Um, uh, Vance was, I've read a lot of Vance. It's one of the authors who's sort of fallen away and people aren't, the readership, I think, they aren't talking so much about Vance and, uh, and his, his uh, really early space opera that, that he was doing, uh, really good work. Um, and then um, another name I've mentioned quite a bit is uh, um, Carl Edward Wagner. And okay. His work is a brutal horror, horror fantasy mix that's just wonderful. Uh -huh. Very powerful stuff. So this is, uh, that's, that's why I got this down from the shelf because yeah. uh, again, fascinating fascinating approach to fantasy like we we talk about grimdark as this very modern invention but you know as, as philip and i had discussed in a previous video the the origins of grimdark yeah. uh, have uh, extend far back in time and and we see a lot of what is now being associated with grimdark uh, all of those things were, were present in fantasy in certain authors uh prior well, to Beowulf Be is a grim and dark story i mean as, as probably as you talked about it, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then um, I wasn't just reading, uh, then I went into university and pursued more um, literary studies, okay. you know, the traditional stuff, uh, yeah. Brit, Brit lit, American lit, Russian lit, uh, and French lit, uh, and read, and I know I'm privileged in that sense, in that I've been to university and I've taken courses in, in literature and studied literature and then went on and even taught literature in grad school and in PhD programs. Uh, so my, I, my, that, my encouragement to, to people in the genre who, who love the genre, reading the genre would be to do that, to spread out your readings and look at not just other genres, but also um, what people would call contemporary literature. Wonderful, yeah. It, Glenn Cook, is he another fantasy author? That we yes, Glenn yeah. Cook. I mean, we've given, we bowed down so um, often there that it's almost needn't be uh, mentioned. It's yeah. de definitely a um, big influence. Uh, and um, also, of course, Donaldson. Stephen Donaldson, yeah, yeah. The, the, the uh, ambition that he brought to the genre. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. All right. Thank you. Um, so let's move on. Oh, okay, no, go ahead. Let's move on. Give me a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, amateurs. Oh, what, what, who am I working with here? Um, but uh, interesting. Uh, Dumas uh, obviously crops up uh, a little bit. Uh, you know, the, the three musketeers having a, a significant impact because a lot of this fed into the gaming. Um, and you can spot the, the three musketeers turning up. Uh, yeah, um, the, the, the game originally uh, that I wrote up for Steve's characters, um, Krupp, Relic Nam, and uh, Rick shows up as, as well. Those are Steve's characters. And so um, he had mapped Ginnabacchus. And so I got to fill it in. That was our agreement. You know, if, if someone did a, a geographic setting the other person could do the cultural settings huh. and so i wrote up Darugistan and all of that region southern and central Ginnabacchus, in order to run games uh for steve uh and i decided to do sort of an homage to the three musketeers in that game so gardens of the moon is the three <laughs> musketeers retold but not in a programmatic sense. Uh, like we have Baruch and, and other things going on in the, in the place of the um, Cardinal, we have Baruch as a sort of this enemy, frenemy figure. Um, and uh, so when um, people who are reading Erickson and as we've discussed outside of this um, recording, the strict purest Erickson readers who, who are, are unwilling to look beyond the, the main 10, as they would say. Uh -huh. uh, funnily enough, when they're reading gardens, they're reading a lot of my stuff yeah. because I, 
I wrote that. <laughs> He's game. <laughs> and then we, then we adapted it into a screenplay, and then Steve novelized it. And so you can't separate our, you know, our creative input in, in any of this work. Yeah, you, you co-wrote the screenplay, correct? That he based the novel on, yes? Yeah. So, so what you're basically saying, Cam, is that uh, Ericsson's a hack. <laughs> it's it's strange i sort of set out on this journey I've, I've always wanted to be a fantasy writer and then steve i found a, a partner in crime and so we motivated each other and, and uh, validated each other's silly ambition to write fantasy uh but my problem my blessing and my curse i think as, as a writer in the genre is that this guy ended up being a damn genius <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't pick him, you know, I didn't know that was going to happen. How and dare he? How dare yeah. he be a genius? Yeah. And so it's a blessing because it brings attention to the work. It, it you know, and it adds so much to the world and, and his success. But it's a curse as well, because, uh, of course, I'm always going to be uh, that other guy. No, no, no. Wait a second here. Uh, you're no slouch. <laughs> uh, you're no slouch yourself. And I would also like to say that in my opinion, and obviously people can have different opinions on this, but um, in my opinion, when you take everything that you two have written together in the Malazan world, the books of the Malazan world, that's how I refer to it. And I'm sure others do too. For me, and I, I said this uh, at the end of our discussion with, uh, that'll be on AP's channel as well. You two have created the greatest fantasy story of all time. I mean, of the greatest fantasy series of all time. And it's, it's, for me, it's both of you. And you can't, I know that there are separate series that tell their own stories, but there's, there are many points of connection and they absolutely, the, the, uh, the whole is greater than the parts uh, because of it. Uh, so I really, I, I think it's just, it's uh, the greatest achievement in the genre. Um, so, and, and of course, I would not go that far, but you know, thank you very much. Well, um, I certainly would. I don't think AP would disagree with me either, would you, AP? Well, I wouldn't call it a hole. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's a very deep hole. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, uh, anyone who, who's watched some of the videos that I've done, there's a reason why I can I can get away with long videos discussing themes and complex prose and deconstructing things in the Malazan world and in the Malazan books, yeah. because the, the books can sustain that level of examination on a surface level of narrative through the subtextual levels, all the way down to the deep thematic connections. These books, this world, everything that was created between the two of you, can sustain that and not every fantasy novel can not every novel of any genre can sustain that level of scrutiny or bear fruit from that level of scrutiny and yet that's something that i find consistently in your work in ericsson's work uh, that i can mine like a parasite and put on my channel <laughs> that's what a critic is isn't it a parasite Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> We've seen some of uh, the characters in Steve's books. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've talked about Apto Cannavali and um, we had a good time too. Yeah. If you haven't so, watched that, you should, yeah. Um, influences as well then, um, war fiction. Um, okay. Uh, both fictional accounts, uh, as Steve and I have talked about, like uh, Tim O'Brien, but also uh, memoirs and, and nonfiction accounts. Uh -huh. um, and so for treatment of war and battle uh, and it fed into it. And, and then of course, all of our history, uh, both Steve and I minored in the classics at, at okay. one point and uh, yeah. I looked at Greek and Roman art and archeology, span Greek and Roman history and archeology span and lots of influences <laughs> coming together. Great stuff, yeah. AP, can we move on now? <laughs> <laughs> the royal wave. We're gonna work on that royal wave there. Um, all right, so um, 
for the next thing, and it's, these are all very related questions, but uh, if you wouldn't mind, you actually started to talk about it a little already, but um, if you would describe your journey as a writer uh, and beginning, if you, if you don't mind with your education and you've touched on the process already of creating the Malazan world along with Steven Erickson, um, all the way to publication, how did that happen? And um, so I guess just looking back on the whole thing, what are some of the important moments in your mind? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I always, as I said, I always wanted to be a writer. That was my goal. Huh. Uh, but then, uh, I was told that uh, that was not a very realistic goal by the school guidance counselor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same here, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, I was always writing on the side and, and little pastiches and stories. And I would take other people's writing apart and see how it was, you know, trying to figure out how it worked. Yeah. Um, and then I met Steve on an archaeological dig, and he was this. The dark secret came out that he too was uh, uh, wanted to be a fantasy writer, and and so we uh, encouraged and validated each other's efforts there, and that was a big uh, surprise and uh, immense help to me. I owe you know very much to support in that. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but he went the hard route. He went straight into the private sector and said, I'm going to shop my stuff and I'm going to die on this hill. Right. <laughs> he made that pledge. Uh, whereas I just stayed in academia and I uh, went on into a PhD program at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I was decided, well, you know, maybe I just need to get a job. Day job. Yeah, yeah day job. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, meanwhile, Steve was getting a lot of success with the first three, four, or five of his books that had, had uh, come out. I'm not sure exactly how far along he had gotten at this point. Uh, and he was always, you know, bless him, saying, hey, Hey, you should look at this guy's stuff too. He's, he's writing in the world and uh, it stands up. It's, it's publishable. Hmm. Um, but the um, publishers were unwilling, not only because my style isn't Steve's, it's a different style. And uh, so they could see that maybe the readers would be confused or, you know, to, to not be kind about it, they might say, well, it's not as good. Or, you know, the publishers have their their views on on what they think is good or bad or adds to a world uh so they were reluctant uh it actually kind of was in the way this shared world uh because there's been shared worlds in fantasy right uh -huh. thieves world i think these world aspirin and others and they kind of they they had problems they kind of you know fell apart and uh yeah. and i think that the public felt a little burned um and were wary of of it but eventually, um, I guess Steve got his way and uh, <laughs> managed to get it to the right eyes, the, uh, the manuscript. Uh, and I was offered this book deal while I was struggling with my dissertation. Okay, wow. And um, I had to make a choice because uh, I don't think it would come along. I don't think that train would come around again. Yeah. Uh, so I just, um, had my opportunity and I went for it and I decided to pursue writing. Oh, we're happy you did. I mean, that's a, it's a, probably a little bit of a choice, but I would, in your position, I would have thought about it for exactly a second, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, I'd like to think that um, I can contribute more this way, uh, I, uh, I hope. Yeah. Oh, I would say so. Yeah. So. Um, well, I, I was just thinking, we, we talked about your influences in terms of the literary influences, and then obviously, you know, your, your journey as a, as a writer. Um, but you mentioned it obliquely, and I know that you and Steve have said many times, you know, about the, the gaming and that sort of thing. But you started out in D&D, &D, you, move, you moved to the GURP system. So um, I'm just, uh, to pin down some of this stuff, because one of the things that I know uh, is obviously I've had conversations with with you and Erickson just as, as we've been hanging out. And so I have certain details that I know from private conversations. 
and I can't I can't talk about those <laughs> because they were private conversations. So the the D and D aspects, um, because you introduced a lot of this stuff to Ericsson. Can can you talk a wee bit about that so I can maybe interject when you reveal something that I know a bit about? <laughs> <laughs> um, the gaming, I think, was um, more just an excuse to to for for the character play. Hmm. Right, we needed a, a mechanism, a mechanics, so that we could play, you know, do build our plots and um, go back and forth in our character development and our, um, all that play, uh, which uh, is so much, which we just enjoyed, both the, the writing of it and, and the gaming of it. Uh, and I think we found, started to find that the mechanics in D&D were in, inhibiting the freedom of play that we wanted. And so we tried out the GURPS system. Um, but then, you know, I came from a, a big, gaming club at the University of Manitoba. And I've played Paranoia, I've played RuneQuest, uh, and I've played even Tunnels and Trolls. I mean, everything I've played. Um, and uh, in, in, in fact, it goes back so far that originally it was the War Gaming Club. You know, you know, no one can get away with that anymore. Uh, it just, and then in the 80s, it transitioned into the gaming world, right? no longer war gaming. Uh, because one of the, one of the the stories I've heard about was uh, the the dry expansion pack that came out very early eighties, and I think you and Steve were in Victoria at the time when it came out, and it was the box set of Manazaraban, um, and Ericsson had told this story about getting the box set and the two of you being all excited to open it. And then you looked at the map and you looked at the, the contents and how the Droy Society had been constructed. And this obviously was when when R.A. Salvatore was publishing the, the Dritz Jordan books. And um, that was before you moved to GURPS, I think. <laughs> His memory might be better on this than mine then. Uh, but we were always a bit dubious of the... Uh, writing in in the uh, culture building and uh, social organizations and the geography and geology that we were seeing in in the uh, backdrops that were being provided for the game and we did so we just did our own oh oh you you did your own is that why the 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 tie standy are an awful lot like dry <laughs> or a certain sword is an awful lot like <laughs> another uh, yeah, well, you know, we have we just plucked um, and put, picked and chose what we wanted to use. Uh, we knew we didn't want to go the Tolkien high fantasy route of dwarves and <clears throat> elves and, and all of that. So we decided to take elements of that and, and build our own uh, races. Because obviously, I mean, a lot of D&D &D was heavily influenced by Jack Vance and Fritz Lieber. Like, all of those influences were, were there for Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax. Like, and you can see that in the, the early That's editions what... of D&D. &D. Yeah. Was it a, Appendix N was the, where they had listed all of these different authors that you should read. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, it was all sword and sorcery and planetary romance and all of those early pulps that they stole from, sorry, were inspired by. Um, and Tolkien was obviously a huge impact on early D&D, &D, so much so that the Tolkien estate had to sue them to get them to change the names of things. Mm. Um, but so even though you, you and, and Ericsson went that sort of slightly different, focusing more on a, a lot of the military aspects and, and taking in that tradition, the Tolkienian aspect was uh, coming in twofold, both in through your reading of Tolkien and the Silmarillion, but also in the construction of D&D &D and, and how those games had uh, been inspired by <laughs> Tolkien. Well, it was gaming, uh, firstly. So it was um, 
private use. <laughs> 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 not not intended for publication yeah and that's a bit that's a big difference and then you're stuck with it because you designed the world that way yeah yeah uh, and i you know we as we worked with it i think it sort of evolved and got on its own way went its own way uh, the more we worked on it but i i meant to ask you about this actually when we we had been talking about the books um there's, there's a certain thief character uh, in Stonewielder, and he, he he certainly has a unique approach to being a, a thief with his stealthy movements and uh, his subterfuge about how he sneaks past people. But whenever I was reading those sections, all I could imagine was that you and Steve were sitting in a tent, giggling your asses off, uh, doing this as a uh, as a particular gaming thing so when when we talk about gaming um one of the concepts obviously that gets uh, added or implied with a lot of gaming is min maxing you know creating the most powerful characters but in the malazan world there is an awful lot of absurdity and humor and ridiculousness that again fits seamlessly in with the world and I think, without any factual evidence for this, but I think a lot of that was you and Steve being out in the middle of nowhere in a tent and going slightly stir crazy. So, we, would you care to comment? Just having a lot of fun. I mean, we you pursue that hobby because it's fun. It's uh, and we're just trying to make the other person laugh and break up uh that was the whole goal uh and now and then we just put that into the, the books yeah uh, and that's wonderful well, because you guys in many respects were writing for each other even even as you were writing these books uh that's something that i read in the foreword mm -hmm. to uh, night of knives um and that's wonderful and and kind of fun and everything else so have fun as a writer. Are, are there any other tips um, that you would want to share for aspiring writers? Or I guess, what are some of the most important insights that you have learned over the years as a writer that you would share with, with our audience? Um, yeah, have fun, you know, make it fun. Uh, and I think that you can't force it, strange enough to say. And I don't mean, you know, writer's block and making yourself write but you can't force the development of things in, in the manuscript. Uh, I think you just have to let them appear organically out of what you're doing. And I think that's when it has an honesty to it. It doesn't feel like an add-on. Uh, it just, um, you allow it, the, 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 you allow the creativity, the room to create. And then when it feels right, then you pursue it, I think. Uh, and so you might have a, um, a bullet list of, oh, this is what's going to happen. No, don't, no outlines, don't do that. Because you could end up somewhere, a character could take on a life of its own and just take over the story. And you have to let that happen because that's, I think, is your creativity telling you something. Huh. But I mean, obviously, like every, every author has their own approach to it. It is a very unique, um, skill because you everyone can use the same techniques but every author has these different approaches to writing because certainly um i've seen outlines of like you said like bullet points or even a, a rough outline and comparing that original outline to what ends up as the book you go are you sure this is the outline that you use to write that book? They're, they're radically different. And I think part of it is what you've just said is that you might start with an idea for a story. Um, you think it's going to go that way, but as you're writing it, you uncover or discover or get led in a slightly different direction. Um, it, would that well, be? A... I'll qualify. I mean, that might sound to readers or, or watchers, viewers right now as well, that's aimless. You'll just, meander without any particular goal. Uh, but I know where I'm going. Like it, I know that I'm, I can see the mountaintop of uh, a sail. I, right. I know that's where I'm headed. Uh, and I know I've already thought about it 
and how you know there's this landmark and there's that landmark uh and so it's already in my mind and that means that if i head off i'm hoping that things are going to my creative um the the thoughts that i have will bring bring me in that direction so i have to trust yeah they're not leading me astray it's not a side you know journey it's being done for a reason to get me to that mountain so it's the creative process that you have to sort of trust in your muse if you will that um that in the you know you're you're writing all day long and you wake up in the middle of the night with an idea that just seems to come out of nowhere and it, it that's a new direction uh for the story that sort of thing allowing that bubbling to happen as you're writing mm -hmm. if you're going to rigidly stick to an outline you're you're going to stifle th that voice uh, i suppose so well, i think so and as if you said every writer is different and yeah works for me yeah. might not work for you and and that's all just that's given yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you, see, you say it's a given but the number of people go oh well Esselmont said that you have to do it this way <laughs> no no <laughs> I think I don't think anyone would ever grant me that much authority. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So any other tips or can we move on to the process itself, the writing process? Um, uh, the writing process. Well, this that's a very similar question. Yeah. So I think it's a good segue, actually. So, I mean, if you wouldn't mind, take us through the in initial stages to the completion of a book and, and that sort of thing. And we're going to talk about advanced readers as well, we'll have a follow-up question on <clears throat> a particular advanced reader. Hmm. I would say, oh God, well, again, it's all different for, for writers, uh, but sure. I find that I start the beginning and I just go through the, right to the end and go chapter by chapter. And I've heard of other authors talking about how they can take threads or point of views or chapters and then they sort of play with them and decide what's best you know yeah. um but i can't do that um for me it's organic and it's like growing a plant or something you know you just start at the beginning you have your kernel your and then you it it just comes out from there step mm -hmm. by step and so i might shave a few scenes uh, or add to some scenes afterwards but um, for me, the process is very uh, linear. Huh. Okay. I mean, how much revision would you typically engage in? Uh, every time I sit down, I go back over what I just did. Okay. And revise it, and then I push on. Okay. Uh, and I go back over the chapters, and I read them through from beginning to end, uh, revise them again. Uh, okay. And that's like um, paragraph, sentence, and word level stuff. Right. Uh, um, I, I, I keep brushing over them as much as I can, uh, as okay. often as I can. Okay. And then do you go back through the entire book once it's you've sort of finished it? Um, rarely, I think. Um, actually, by that point, I would have gone over each chapter several times in sequence and to get to the last. And so I, I feel like I don't have to go back over the whole thing from, okay. from the very beginning, okay. except uh, if the publisher accepts it. And then they send it back to me with suggestions. Then I'll go back to the beginning and look at integrating their feedback and their thoughts. And that's from the publisher and is from uh, any pre-reader I might have as well. Okay. Well, speaking of pre-readers, um, you obviously do use advanced readers and, and you could talk about the role they play and at what point in the process, perhaps you would begin to reach out to them. Uh, it, I'm sure it varies from author to author, uh, with some might just throw a chapter out or a, a part of a book or wait till the whole book is done. But, and, and as much as we have a lot of fun around here teasing AP, <laughs> because he's, he's just fun to tease, uh, he is a, a brilliant scholar of the genre and a very insightful reader who I know has, um, I think AP, your strength isn't just in the details, but in the overall narrative integrity of a story. That is something that uh, is I, I very much admire, is your eye for the narrative integrity of a story. Um, and I know that you are very protective of your authors, uh, very professionally so, so appropriately and professionally. 
you don't talk about what you do uh, with the authors, uh, which is the uh, right way to do it. Um, but um, but Cam here has no such constraints. So uh, what <laughs> is it? I'll disparage and trash talk as much as I want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. If you don't mind, what's it like to work with an advanced reader and, and particularly with AP since he's here and, and we enjoy teasing him? Well, I'm, I'm privileged. I consider it a privilege to, to be yeah. able to work with a, a extraordinary pre-reader. Um, and I didn't always. Uh, he was been working with Steve for a very long time. Yeah. And then he said, hey, I have this uh, pre-reader and, and he's really helped me a lot. And, huh. and so he asked AP if he would be willing to, to uh, look at my stuff as well. Uh, and yeah, and he said, sure. Uh, so by that point, it, I forget which novel it was, AP, but I was already a ways into the series yeah. without any um, single um, assigned pre-reader except for Steve. Right? Uh, and um, then uh, AP graciously came on board with uh, my material and I've uh, benefited ever since. Uh, and to your question, I usually send a couple of chapters at a time. Okay. Okay. And for me, I want um, best the way the reader will experience the book. So I want him being a reader. I want him experiencing the book just a chapter at a time as any fresh face uh, would. Excellent. AP, you want to chime in at all uh, about that? Or I know you, usually you don't say much about that process. So um, I, I agree with everything that Cameron says. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The, just to, to explain why I absolutely don't comment on the stuff that I do with authors. Yeah. What, what I get from authors, be it Ian C. Esselmont or anyone else that I have ever worked with, mm -hmm. that is their book. Any comment I make, any suggestion I make, and, and anything that I give them in, in response to anything, um, they are absolutely free to take it on board or to jettison it or to do whatever they want with it that's that's what i do i i i give them my opinion on things or my analysis on things and the reason i don't talk about what i say about authors work when they they engage me is i never want anyone ever to think at all ever that I have an impact on the book in a in a way that takes away from what an author has done. These right. authors create books. They they have written literature, and all I've done is I've come in and given them feedback on it and and pointed things out, yeah. and gave them those notes, and then they go away and whether they change a single word or move a single comma that that is all them it's yeah. i i never want anyone to think that uh the book is less theirs because of anything that i i comment on and that's that's why i don't talk about any of that aspect right. because it it's not uh, and I, I don't mean to sound like grandiose. Oh, if I talked about it, everyone would go, oh, AP's he's a genius. <laughs> but I, I have had enormous privilege to work with brilliant authors and to see their work when they go, this, this is this draft. And I, I want to have a look at it, but how, do, how does someone feel about it? And I, they are trusting me to look at it. Yeah. when they're going to go back and they're going to tweak things, but they, they wanted a fresh pair of eyes. And you go, yeah, and that's why I'm a developmental editor, looking at structures and sweeps and yeah. through lines and all of that. And, you know, luckily I also was trained in, in close reading and, and all the standard lit analysis. So some of that adds in. And I'm a big fan of the genre. I'm a big fan of writing. Yeah. So I'm a reader like everyone else. I just sometimes it's easier for me to express why I am feeling a certain way about a passage that I can isolate it because as I read through I go oh there's that thing and I see you've done this thing here and it yeah. um and you know if if I am of help to an author 
then that is absolutely fantastic. I like being able to support and help an author create an even better version of their story, of their vision, help them achieve their vision more clearly. That that's how I see what I do uh, in in that particular aspect of, yeah. of my and I, I, I admire your professional integrity in that respect. But I, I do sometimes feel like there's this perception of the author as the lone genius. Um, and that's something I'd like to I personally just kind of dismantle because I personally learn a lot from other people's responses to my writing. And I've changed my writing my over the years many times uh, in response. So having an advanced reader who loves the genre, understands how narratives work, has these insights, it's just, it's a wonderful thing. Would you, would you agree, Cam, with that? Oh, certainly. And yeah. the, um, you know, any pre-reader pre you, you chose, I presume, because you really want to hear what they have to say. Yeah. I mean, uh, otherwise, why would you <laughs> have chosen that individual or offered okay. yeah. yourself up? Um, and AP brings a lot to it. It's just so much. Um, yeah. yeah, for sure. Well, so I guess um, I'd like to also ask you, we don't have a ton of time left, but I'd also like to ask you a couple more questions and AP as, as well, if you have anything, uh, absolutely interrupt me at any point. But um, I'm curious, and, and I'm sure a lot of viewers are curious and your fans about, and you don't have to be too specific, I know, because you can't always do that, but um, anything you're thinking about writing in the future, both within and outside the Malazan world? Um, for example, I read somewhere or other that you do have an idea or, or, some, uh, or, some, or you might have even started a science fiction novel at some point. I don't know if that's something you're comfortable talking about, but what do you, what do you see yourself being up to uh, in a literary sense? Um, well, like, like so many, uh, these last few years have uh, really hit uh, and I found that it's been difficult to, to uh, you know, push the stuff out. So it's, I've taken a hit on, on that. Uh, but I plan to continue on with a few more novels set in the Malazan world. Um, and uh, I hope that the people will enjoy those. Um, and I've also have been working on a, on a science fiction novel that's completely okay. disparate and outside. Uh, and, and unfortunately, it's, it's sat there for so long uh, and that it's actually coming true now. So, uh, <laughs> so now I'm wondering, gee, you know, I missed that. That boat has sailed, maybe. I missed it. I've waited too long. And huh. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I'll talk to AP about it. Um, yeah. But I can't write anything in fantasy out, other than um, the Malaz world, I find, because I've tried. But I just can't. It's, I can only write in fantasy in the Malaz world, strangely enough. Interesting. So there's a very strong pull there, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe some would say, well, it's already established, so it's easy. You can just jump in. Uh, uh, but I just find it so compelling that uh, there's so much more I want to say there that if I start somewhere else, I just get pulled you know, that way. Huh. But I, I think one of the, the strengths of what you and Erickson created is the immense breadth of the Malaz setting, mm -hmm. the, the variety of the peoples, the uh, multitudinous cast, that you, you could write a detective noir in the Malazan universe. You could write a romance in the Malazan universe that it really is, as far as secondary world creation has gone, one of the most complete secondary worlds that has ever been accomplished in fantasy. And I say that including Tolkien's Middle Earth and the entirety of the Legendarium, that uh, the, there's a richness and a depth to the Malazan world that supports multiple stories. So when you, you say like writing fantasy, you have a setting. You, and you've shown with the novels of the Malazan Empire, you've shown with Path to Ascendancy, that there are different stories and different story types and different tongues yeah. uh, and, and different foci, uh, focuses that you use 
to explore different things. So uh, I don't think being locked into a setting just because it's the, the fantasy setting that you you're most attached to or that you find has influenced you uh, is is a problem. I um, We've seen variety from you that you've written the different books anyway. So just because it's the setting, I, I, I don't see a problem with that. Yeah, it's so vast. There's so much to do there. Um, so, and we're definitely happy if you keep writing novels there. So, yeah, you can even write uh, a novella that um, is a, um, a sort of farcical and includes uh, a critic as one of the characters. Uh... <laughs> I think that would be derivative. <laughs> critics are, critics are detectives. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> so wonderful. Well, last question then uh, for me, and this is, I think, a good segue again, uh, because we're talking stuff Malazan. Uh, we had uh, a nice conversation with your co-creator, Stephen Erickson, and um, he talked about the um, his, his work and, and your work being a bit of an island. Um, and uh, he used the word desolate, but I disagreed with that. Um, so, but in the sense that, um, I guess what I'm getting at here is what do you think, uh, what are your thoughts about the Malazan world's place in the fantasy genre? And um, is it a unique achievement? Um, is it, do you see it influencing future authors? Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, you know, I hope that it does in, in the sense that um, it's, it's another take on the genre uh -huh. and we need those. We need other takes, uh, other approaches and new approaches and different views of this rich and worthy and beautiful tradition yeah. that we've been granted, you know, and every new writer will come at it in a new way and and we're offering an example of well you, you this is what you could do you could do this yeah. uh, and so they'll look at that and see that they, they can um, try all kinds of different things uh, maybe that is, is an influence um, and then also um, the writing itself I mean you can um, look at the the tropes and look at all this this stuff that's, that uh, the writers around you are doing and respond to it. Right. Right. And so here is more grist for the for the mill. I mean, you can now you can respond to what what we've done. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I would say personally, from my perspective, um, what you guys set out, and if I'm understanding it correctly, intentionally to do was to create a world it's a very diverse world and it's it's a world that treats gender in a way that I don't think was especially common before you guys started doing it and and that's sort of I think you guys could have a big impact in those terms um, in terms of what people can imagine they can do in fantasy settings um, so that's an example I think of where I believe you guys have had an impact you've been part of something very important where people are exploring more diverse settings and, and um, having more inclusive environments in terms of race and gender and other things and sexuality. Uh, so I, I think that's a fairly important influence there. I don't know what uh, you would agree with that. Um, we, were, we sort of snuck that some of that by in that we never really were explicit about say right. um, racial or ethnic types. Right. Uh, except that um, you sort of learn as you go along that actually everybody is, you know, colored. Right. It, it, everybody in the world. And there's like one group with blonde hair and everyone is astonished. Uh, uh, what is that? Huh. Um, so, it, and, and again, that's a response to the traditional criticism of the, of the genre that it just does faux Northern European settings right. with with uh, Vikings in other costumes. Yeah. Uh, and it's, but we said, well, no, this is a whole world. And if you look at our world, uh, in fact, the majority of people are of color. And so there's yeah. a multitude of that uh, in, in the world. 
uh, and our main characters uh, partake of that, but it's just assumed. It's not even uh, worth mentioning because that's the culture that we're in. Right. right. All right. AP? Well, um, I had, I, had a, I think, quite a, a penetrating question to ask, which is um, the, the Moranth have that chitinous armor. So how do they go to the bathroom when they never get out of the armor? <laughs> I think it's called a cod piece. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, this is why this is the, the type of penetrating, insightful work that I do. If you I, think to... <laughs> he, would. he would write about that on a manuscript. Yes, he would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that brilliance, uh, <laughs> that bit of brilliance, I think we're 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 going to conclude here. Uh, I just want to thank the two of you for this uh, wonderful discussion. Uh, I've enjoyed this time tremendously, and I'm sure our viewers will. And thank you so much. First of all, AP, thank you always, always thank you for for being here and making this so much fun and and helping me learn so much. Uh, it's, it's been a, a really great time and, and Cam, uh, thank you again for being on the, ch the my channel. This is my, my second opportunity to talk to you and, and I hope, uh, this will be able to happen again. Uh, I think the viewers are going to really appreciate, uh, learning, uh, some of your insights and your responses to these questions. So I thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you for having me and. Thanks for this great interview on uh, you know giving me the chance to to talk as on on as an author and as I was saying earlier I I write my letter my letter to the world and now you guys are this is your chance to 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 talk and to, to respond and I respect and we that. do and we do delight in it don't we AP Yes, and uh, if I'd thought ahead there, I would have just talked right over uh, Cameron as he was speaking to make my point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not used to this Zoom thing. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I, I just jump in. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it's, uh, to be perfectly honest, you need to go back to your little garret and, and write more and write more quickly. That, that's what you should do as an author. You know, that's the expectation, Cam. Right, right. Yep. I need to uh, get back to the typing. Well, we will wish you with that then we will wish you happy writing and thank you again for being here thank you all righty